Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the PCB of the Gigabyte B650E Aorus Master Motherboard. Now this board was sent to me by Gigabyte, so big thank you to them for providing the motherboard for, for testing and for this video. And with that out of the way, let's get right into it. Starting off with this board's probably most noteworthy feature, which is the fact that it uses the exact same CPU PCIe lane configuration that you would find on the Gigabyte X670E Aorus Extreme, a motherboard that costs basically twice as much. Um, which means that you've got four Gen 5 M.2 slots here. Now, uh, this isn't really natively supposed to be done on uh, Ryzen 7000 series CPUs as they don't really have enough PCIe lanes for it. So the way this is set up is that these two Gen 5 uh, slots go directly to the CPU. There's nothing weird going on with those. You can use those. It doesn't do it. Like, there's nothing special with those. Uh, those just go directly to the CPU. However, these two Gen 5 M.2 slots down here uh, are wired through these PCIe switches over here. And what's basically going on is that you have X8 going into the uh, X16 slot, and the other X8 goes into the switches. Um, and now, if you don't have any M.2 drives installed in these two M.2 slots down here, those switches will send X8 back to the X16 slot, and you get full X6, uh, X16. However, as soon as you install any M.2 drive uh, into one of these two uh, M.2 slots, uh, your X16 slot, X16, X16 slot drops down to X8, uh, and uh, yeah, because that's just how PCIe switches work, because the x8 gets rerouted to these two m.2 slots so if you're a file copying enthusiast and you want to have four gen 5 m.2 drives on this motherboard you can and they're going to all be connected directly to the cpu and you're going to basically have as much pcie storage bandwidth as you can really get on a uh, b650 or really any am5 motherboard like, the only way you could go faster than this is if you put, like, an M.2 adapter card directly into the X16 slot. Um, but uh, the downside, of course, is that, yeah, as soon as you use even, a, like, any M.2 drive in either of these uh, M.2 slots, your X16 slot drops down to X8. Now, most of, like, these days that shouldn't really cause any major performance issues, but... Uh, uh, personally, I would have preferred it if they used the, X, the the switches to give you a secondary X8 slot, because that way you can choose whether or not those X8 lanes get converted into M.2 slots or maybe something else, um, right? So let's say you have a rendering workstation, you could have a second GPU attached to that or something. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm not a fan of the fact that this is really inflexible, but hey, if you like copying files very, very quickly, uh, this is... I think the only B650E motherboard that gives you four Gen 5 M.2 slots. Um, and yeah, and there's really no other way to do this on AM5. Even on X670E motherboards, this is done exactly the same way. Uh, like I mentioned, this is actually copied directly off of the Gigabyte X670A or S Extreme. Like, it's the exact same PCIe configuration as, as that board. So... Yeah, um, while I'm not a fan of it, because I don't really have any super high-speed storage or files to move around between my very non-existent high-speed drives, uh, I guess if that's something you do, this is a uh, interesting option for a motherboard uh, for you. Anyway, other than that, internally we've got an X4 PCIe 4.0 uh, slot over here that just runs off of the chipset, and there's also a PCIe 3.0 by 2 also running off of the chipset. Uh, down here, uh, wait, oh yeah, you get four SATA ports, which is just a limitation of the B650 chipset. There's just not that many, uh, like it just doesn't have that much bandwidth available, so you only get four SATA ports on most boards. There are even some B650 boards where you only get two. Uh, there's an internal Type-C connector over here, and that uh, pretty much covers all of the internal, like, well, m fancier internal connectors that you get with this board. Uh, so let's move on to the rear I.O., where you get a Q Flash Plus button, a clear CMOS button, so with this you can update the BIOS of the motherboard without even having a compatible CPU. It can also potentially recover from, like, BIOS corruption, though that is not its intended purpose. It can sometimes uh, recover from that. You got Wi-Fi 6E below that, which I think is the AMD Wi-Fi 6E, I'm not really sure. I don't really care about Wi-Fi. Um, there's a ton of USB Type-A ports, which I'm a big fan of, right? You get, what is it? You get four, two, so that's six, 10, 12. You get 12 Type-A ports, so yeah, I can't complain about that. There's a Type-C over here. Um, 
like I yeah, there, there's a Type C over here which uh, apparently is 10 gigabit. Uh, you get two and a half gigabit LAN. I think it's real tech. Yeah, it's real tech. Um, and then you get an optical out as well as a line out and mic in for your audio port. So the audio section is a bit cut down, um, but as a trade-off for that, you do get a ton of USB ports. And also, funnily enough, you get a clear CMOS button, which isn't present on the X670E uh, Master. The X670E Master has an internal clear CMOS button, which I think is really silly, because if you need to take the side panel off the case in order to reach the clear CMOS button, you may as well just use the clear CMOS jumper at that point, right? Which uh, is also present on this board and is right here. So now let's talk about some of the overclocking functionality since we're on the topic of clear CMOS. So yeah, you get a clear CMOS jumper over here. There's the rebindable uh, reset switch. So by default, this just acts as a reset switch. Uh, it does have the option for a safe boot, which I've not managed to get working on AM5. On Z690, Z790, this switch is amazing. You set it to safe boot. You never ever have to save a BIOS profile again, pretty much. I still wouldn't recommend that you use it that way, but you, you can, and it, it'll probably be fine. Um, but yeah, I've not gotten the safe boot to work on any AMD motherboard so far. Um, however, it also offers options like boot directly into the BIOS. I think there's even an RGB off function as, as an option for this. So there's a few different things that you can do with this button. Uh, and if you want to wire that button to your front panel, there's a header for it right there. Next to that, there's also like an external temperature sensor header. You get some like temperature probes with the board in the accessory pack. Anyway, there's also some troubleshooting LEDs over here, which are made completely redundant by the fact that this board has a postcode as well as the power button up here. So the postcode is obviously very helpful if you're doing a lot of memory overclocking as uh, it, especially, yeah, like it, it'll just tell you if the, the system's like stuck on something or if it's actually going through the usual uh, memory training procedure. So I, I really like having postcodes. And I think off the top of my head, I want to say that this is actually one of the cheapest AM5 motherboards with a postcode, which uh, is rough because this is not a particularly cheap board. But unfortunately, uh, motherboard manufacturers have collectively decided that postcodes are now a premium feature. And so here we are. Um, anyway, um, so in terms of overclocking features, like this is, I'd say, pretty fully featured. Like there's not really anything... Ex like for daily overclocking, there really isn't anything extra that I would want from this board. Like mostly it's just like, I want to post code. I would really like a safe boot function, but considering that the, that doesn't seem to work on any AMD motherboards, I'm I'm fine with, you know, just having the post code. That's it's a lot better than being stuck with uh, troubleshooting LEDs. Um, especially since the boot up procedure on Ryzen can, like the memory training on Ryzen currently can be a bit, uh, a bit long, so. Yeah, anyway, let's move on to talking about the power de delivery. Um, so we've got all of this. And this is actually the exact same power delivery that you would get on a Gigabyte X670 Aorus Master. So this board is kind of like a mishmash of uh, some of the features of an X670 Aorus Extreme and some of the features of the X670 Master, but with a much cheaper chipset. Um, so, yeah, to me, this board makes Gigabyte's X670 lineup look kind of silly. <laughs> like, unless you need the extra connectivity directly from the chipset, there's very little reason to get an X670 board, in my opinion. Um, anyway, so, uh, this, so this main part uh, is all V-Core. Actually, I'll put that here, I think. So that's all V-Core. Uh, then over here we have the SOC power rail, um, and actually I'll put that down here. So that's our SOC power rail. Um, and then down here you have VDD MISC, which I'll just label as MISC. Um, so this primarily powers the in integrated voltage regulators for the Infinity fabric, uh, and this powers the SO like the IO die and like iGPU and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, and for vCore, well, actually, let's talk about the control. It's been so long since I've done a PCB breakdown. I'm, I'm sorry, it's going to be a bit of a mess. Um, but yeah, the controller for, for vCore on this board is a Renaissance, for vCore and SOC, is a Renaissance RAA2296-20. Uh, uh, this is the exact same controller that you get on an X670 Aorus, X670E Aorus Master. 
Here it's running as an 8 plus 2 phase, which is the same as, again, the master. Like, it really is the same VRM. They've just changed the inductors, which really doesn't do much of anything uh, to the board's performance. Um, so, yeah, 8 plus 2 phase. The plus 2 is for the SoC. Now, the 8 for V-Core, obviously, you might be looking at this and going like, wait a minute, there's a lot more than 8 power stages here. How, how are these being controlled? Well, it's the standard for modern motherboards. You take one PWM signal and you just shove it into two power stages at the same time. Uh, this doubles your current handling capacity per phase and doesn't add the extra cost and complexity of having doublers, um, which is why we don't see doublers anymore. Um, so yeah, this is a eight phase with two power stages per phase. And so effectively you've got like 16 power stages worth of current handling capability along with 16 inductors worth of current handling capability for uh, V-Core. Now, the actual uh, power stages that are being used here are uh, Renesas, RAA, um, and this is again exactly the same as the X670 Aorus Master, actually the same as the X670 Aorus Extreme as well. Um, 220540s. These are 105 amp uh, smart power stages, at least on paper, because in practice you are not putting 105 amps through any power stage <laughs> because it'll produce entirely too much heat. Even if you had 90% efficiency at 105 amps, you'd be looking at over 10 watts of heat. And at 105 amps, you're not going to have 90% efficiency out of a power stage. That's just not happening. Uh, also, 100 amp inductors don't come in packages this small. Um, that's, that's just not a thing. So, yeah, this, this is really more... You can think of the, the nominal current rating of a smart power stage more as a performance class than an actual useful, practical, uh, like, current output capability. Um, it, under very specific circumstances, this is achievable. Um, in any real-world implementation, it isn't. Um, so, at least not in any real-world implementation I've ever seen. Um, I think if you had maybe like one power stage and just a massive heatsink on top of it, then yeah, probably you could get 100 amps out of it. Um, anyway, uh, since there is 16 of them, this is still massive overkill for any CPU that you can put into this socket, because even a 7950X really struggles to pull more than 200 amps. So anyway, let's talk about theoretical VRM efficiency figures. So 500 kilohertz, uh, like switching frequency, 1.2 volts output voltage. At 200 amps output current, the power stages on this board should only produce about 15 watts of heat, which is less than one watt of heat per power stage, which means that you can totally run this board with no VRM heatsink whatsoever. Uh, the board does come with a very substantial VRM heatsink assembly, but it, it just deserves no actual per... well, it does make the VRM run slightly cooler, but it's not like the VRM would be running particularly hot without it. So, you know, like personally, I would have preferred if the board didn't have heat sinks and was cheaper, but oh well. Um, anyway, 200 amps output, 15 watts of heat, so yeah, less than a 1 watt per power stage. Like, this is trivial to dissipate with just the surface area of the power stage itself and the motherboard, especially since this uses an 8-layer PCB. So the motherboard has quite a lot of, like, thermal mass just in itself, and a pretty like, the ability of the board to dissipate heat on its own is actually very go good. So... Yeah, like, a 7950X is, is not even gonna, like, it's, it's it's nothing for this VRM. Literally nothing. <laughs> anyway, 300 amps output, the VRM would produce about 23 watts from the power stages. So at this point, the heatsink, eh, eh, no, you can still get away with, you know, get away with that without the, the VRM heatsink. Um, so, yeah, I mean, at this point, the... VRM would be running quite warm, um, probably approaching 100 degrees, maybe slightly above that. But that's still not a problem for, for power stages. Like, generally speaking, uh, you know, power stages are, well, good to 100 degrees, 110. Um, actually, most thermal, like, most VRM thermal shutoff points are set to 125 degrees Celsius. So, um, the thing is, 125 degrees on the 25 on the power stages would mean that your capacitors would be getting kind of hot, so that's not ideal. But the power stages still wouldn't really care. Um, it's just everything else around them wouldn't be too thrilled about the situation. Anyway, 400 amps output, and now the VRM actually starts needing heat sinks, as it would start out outputting about 33 watts of heat. At this point, we're above 2 watts per power stage, and yeah, that's not really 
uh, you can't really handle that without with just the the board and and power stages themselves. So now you actually need some heat sinks uh, and 500 amps output. Which uh, <laughs> like the funny thing about this is I'm pretty sure you could probably hit that with a 7950X on LN2. This is not happening. Um, not on any CPU that you can currently put the, into this socket. But let's say someday AMD puts out a chip that does pull this much current, this VRM still wouldn't have any issues with it as it would only produce about 48 watts of heat, uh, which definitely you need a heatsink, okay? Like, yes, the VRM heatsink at that point will be uh, very useful. Um, I have serious doubts that we will ever see a CPU that pulls that much current in this socket. Um, at, at that point, the socket might actually start posing some electrical issues as uh, uh, that, that is a lot of current to be shoving through pins. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so that's the vCore VRM, and it's pretty standard affair for high-end AM5 motherboards, it's massive overkill. Or even low-end AM5 motherboards, because you can get, like, the X670 Aorus Elite, and that also has no issues powering a 7950X, Prime 95, small FFTs, static overclock, with no VRM heatsink. It, it can do it. Um, so yeah, th this board really doesn't change that in any way, shape, or form. Um, it, it's massive overkill. So, uh, the SOC VRM is not as insanely overkill, though still incredibly overkill, as Gigabyte has a ton of ISL 99390s, um, which they use on a variety of different products, so they've just kind of slapped two of them in the SOC VRM on this board. These are 90 amp smart power stages. Uh, they actually perform very similarly to the 105 amp parts from, from actually, Intercell and Renaissance are kind of the same thing, so, yeah, that's... It's not really too surprising, but yeah, there's not too much of a performance difference between these. This is really more just like bigger number bet is better for marketing purposes, which is the main reason I suspect that like smart power stages these days have nominal current ratings into the 100 amps plus range, because realistically you're not using that. But uh, anyway, yeah, 90 amp smart power stages for the SOC rail is two of them in a two-phase configuration is just massive, ridiculous overkill. The IO die is never, ever going to pull uh, that much current. In fact, the IO die of Ryzen 7000 pulls less current than the IO die of the 5000 series. So, you know, and on 5000 series, like most motherboards had a two-phase SOC VRM, VRM with like 50 amp power stage, actually not even power stages, you had 50 amp DR MOS components. And it was absolutely no issue because the SOC never pulled more than like 20, uh, 20 watts anyway. 7000 series pulls even less power, but uh, 90 amp smart power stages are readily available and when your motherboard is over $300, they don't really change the total cost that much. Also, they look good in the marketing specs. Mar marketing specs. So, uh, yeah, that, that's what's going on over there. The miscellaneous rail is uh, kind of basically more of the same, though the main VRM controller, the Renaissance 229620, doesn't have enough phases that it could also handle miscellaneous on its own. Uh, and so Gigabyte opted to slap a RAA uh, 229621, uh, which is a lower phase count version of the 229620. Uh, I'm not sure how many phases this tops out at, but here it's configured as just a two-phase, and, like, we've got more 90-amp smart power stages from Intercell for the miscellaneous rail. So, where the SOC rail now has to do less work than it did on the 5000 series, this, this literally just powers the Infinity Fabric. Um, it, it, or, that's, like, the main thing it powers. It, it doesn't need to be this good, like, it, this, this is, like... This is more overkill than the SOC rail is. Because, um, yeah. So, but, you know, Gigabyte's already using the 90 amps more power stages, so I was just like, well, let's just put more of them. They're already, like, we're already, they're already part of the production line, so may as well. But I do not understand why they decided to use two of them. I really think they could have gone with one, um, especially for the miscellaneous rail, like for the SOC rail, you, you have the argument that if AMD puts out a big, uh, I, like puts a big IGPU in some CPU d down the line, uh, or in some APU down the line, uh, IGPUs can pull quite a bit of current. So in that scenario, this might actually become somewhat useful, maybe. Um, but this right here, like, <laughs> I don't know what they plan to, like, I, there's no reason for this whatsoever. In fact, most, uh, sensible power delivery designs on AM5 will have like a, an integrated single phase 
a uh, buck converter, um, just a single chip solution instead of this three chip solution, which just adds cost for uh, no real benefit. Like, yeah, there's really no reason to go this far for the miscellaneous power rail. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, like Gigabyte had 90 amp smart power stages to spare, I guess. So two phase miscellaneous rail, here we go. Uh, for the filtering, um, well, let's talk voltage regulation, because I've actually taken measurements of the, uh, uh, like, oscilloscope measurements of this VRM, and it performs exactly the same as the VRM of the Gigabyte X670 Aorus Extreme, which might sound like a good thing until you consider the fact that the X670 Aorus Extreme has an incredibly aggressive load line calibration, which means that even on the droopiest LLC setting, you still get very large amounts of undershoot. Um, which limits its capability in like static overclocking scenarios. Now, if you're just using PBO, it's not an issue because the incredibly aggressive load line is actually part of AMD's specification for Ryzen 7000. And yeah, so basically the issue is that like Gigabyte's sort of default uh, LLC options when applied to the spec load line from AMD max out at like 60 millivolts of v-droop at 200 amps which just leaves you with a ton of ton of undershoot um and uh yeah that's that's kind of an issue if you're doing static overclocking you're going to get better voltage regulation out of like uh well i've seen better voltage regulation on a b650 live mixer from asrock uh asus the the gene from asus is way better in terms of voltage regulation than any of the gigabyte boards as well so, yeah, for, like, it's not an issue if you're just running Cinebench or something, but if you're running, like, Y-Cruncher and other very uh, transient heavy loads, uh, Gigabyte's, like, it's not even, like, a component selection or capacitor issue. Well, debatably better capacitor selection might help, but uh, the main issue is just, like, you cannot apply enough V-Droop. Whereas on Asus boards, you can apply... Actually, the most V-droop of any AM5 motherboards that I've tested so far. And so consequently, on, on Asus boards, you can just kind of tune the undershoot out um, with just more and more V-droop. And that happens at around LLC level 4 off the top of my head, uh, which is about twice as much V-droop as what you, what you, like, where the Gigabyte board maxes out. Um, so, yeah. Um, the voltage regulation is... Not the best. Um, and yeah, it's, I'm kind of, and it's really just a VRM configuration problem. It's it's not components or anything. It's just like needs more V-droop. There's just not enough V-droop. The, the VRM can't handle fast transients if it's trying to, if there's only 60 millivolts of V-droop. That's just not going to happen on a motherboard. Um, so... Uh, yeah, but anyway, let's talk about the, I guess, filtering configuration, which also isn't actually that impressive. So for the vCore VRM, we've just got this, these capacitors over here for bulk capacitance. Uh, these are 10,000 hour rated uh, Nichicon, yeah, Nichicon FP caps, um, 560 microfarads, 6.3 volts, pretty standard for output filtering. And there is, uh, what is it, 10 of them? Yeah, 10 of them, um, which is you know, quite a lot of bulk capacitance, but unfortunately bulk capacitance doesn't, like, the, the, these are through-hole capacitors. They do not deal with fast transients well. They have too much ESL. They're mainly here to absorb uh, load release overshoot from the inductors, and that, yeah, so for undershoot, they're kind of useless. Um, and on the back of the board, where you find, like, the higher frequency filtering capacitors inside the, you know, like behind the CPU socket over here, which are these MLCCs, uh, there's not that many of them. Um, Gigabyte has a relatively simple multi-layer ceramic configuration in, in like behind the socket. Um, like ASRock actually has like an extent, like a customized backplate design, which gives them more space for capacitors behind the socket directly. Uh, Gigabyte has basically the same style of backplate that you would find on Asus boards, except Gigabyte's only using, like, this area of the socket, and the rest of it's for, like, signals and vias. Um, so, yeah. Though, funnily enough, like, if I'm, if you match the amount of V-droop that a Gigabyte has to an, like, an Asus board to the amount of V-droop that a Gigabyte board has, the voltage regulation ends up being the same. Um, 
So I really don't think this is like a hardware issue where it's like, oh, the filtering configuration is wrong. It's just like the board needs more V-droop. Because, um, yeah, at 60 millivolts, the ASUS boards also struggle to maintain good voltage regulation. That That's just, it's not enough V-droop for, for a motherboard. Um, so, yeah, anyway, so that's the output filtering configuration for, for V-core. And then for input filtering, we've got... Uh, is that it? Yeah, we've got six um, 270 microfarad FP caps from Nichicon again, 10,000 hours rated, and these are 270 microfarads. This is a pretty substantial input filtering uh, capacitor bank, like, yeah, for bulk bulk capacitance. It's not super well distributed around the power plane, like most of it's up here, um, but it doesn't real like, the input filtering really doesn't matter that much, especially with the, the through-hole capacitors. Like, these have so much ESL in their just like just due to the type of capacitor that they are that like distributing them completely evenly around the power plane really doesn't do much um you know if you were if you had like if you put all a bunch of multi-layer ceramics up here that would be not great because those are multi-layer ceramics they would perform a lot better if you actually put them near the power stages but for through hole capacitors that doesn't really matter too much and you can see exactly that with the multi-layer ceramics uh, behind the board, right? Like th these large multi-layer ceramics right here, these are for uh, basically filtering the switching noise right at the power stage and handling like the turn-on transient uh, of the high side MOSFET. So yeah, and the SOC filtering actually is a bit better than what you see on the V-Core and like miscellaneous rail, which the miscellaneous rail really doesn't matter. Actually, even SOC doesn't really matter. This rail really, like the big transients on Ryzen CPUs all happen on vCore. The SOC and the miscellaneous rail, if you don't have any, like if you don't have a bunch of power save, power management stuff running, uh, they really don't experience many transients. They're pretty much a constant output current. And so the voltage regulation on those is very, very good, even with like very simple, uh, well, you can basically max the LLC and it just doesn't affect the voltage regulation at all. Um, so you don't actually need V-droop on those because the, the current draw is very, like, it's very consistent regardless of how much load you have. It do, there's no big, fast transients. And so, um, yeah, like, the SMD polymers here, it this is mostly that gigabyte ran out of space on the front of the board rather than, like, oh, this is to make, you know, the filtering of the SOC power delivery significantly better. That That's not the case. It's just there wasn't any space on the front of the board, so they put them over here. So they put some SMD capacitors on the back to meet the bulk capacitance requirement for the SOC power rail. Arguably, if, if we see a big iGPU, these might help. But yeah, as it is right now, um, you know, these, these don't really affect anything that matters because it's the SOC rail. It really doesn't. It, it's not like it doesn't put a lot of it, it's just not very transient heavy so um that's the power delivery it's very powerful i just really wish gigabyte had more llc options or not more llc options but like better llc options because the whole issue is that going from ultra extreme llc which is zero v droop to like standard llc you get like 60 millivolts of e-droop, which is just not enough. I would really prefer to see the standard LLC being like 200 millivolts of e-droop, which would probably be too much. Um, but then you'd have like, you know, low LLC could be like 120, medium could be 60, uh, high. Actually, I'd probably put medium at like 100 or something. So yeah, I, I think Gigabyte just needs to set the LLC uh, options a bit differently. And then for static overclocking, this should match ASUS boards based on my testing. Um, but yeah, if you're doing PBO overclocking, this really isn't an issue because the, like the, this really aggressive load line is actually spec from AMD. That, that's just how Ryzen is supposed to work. Um, anyway, uh, you do get two 8-pin power connectors. You don't need to plug both of them in. Even a like maxed out 7950X is not going to max out a single 8-pin power connector, especially since Gigabyte is using the high current variant of the connector with solid metal pins instead of the folded metal pins. So yeah, if your power supply only has a single 8-pin, uh, just pretend that this one doesn't exist. It, it may as well not exist. It really doesn't affect anything because you can't put a uh, th there's currently no, like, 350-watt CPU that you can put into this socket. So, 
Um, yeah, that's that's not an issue. Um, or even, well, depending on your power supply's uh, cabling, you can even put like 400 plus watts through a single 8-pin power connector, but at that point you need like a power supply with 16-gauge uh, wires uh, instead of just the standard like 18-gauge. Um, anyway, um, let's move on to some of the other power delivery. So we've covered everything that goes directly to the CPU. Uh, there's also the VDDIO mem regulator, which is this over here. Um, this literally just powers the memory controller. Uh, Gigabyte's basically using what they did on their, like, used for powering the memory on their DDR4 boards. It's massive overkill for DDR5. It's three discrete MOSFETs. Um, well, it's... It's much less overkill than everything else, but because, like, with DDR4, that same voltage regulator of made up of uh, two low-side MOSFETs, one of them is on the back, uh, and then the other low-side MOSFET is over here, and then your high-side's over here. Like, this same thing used to power the memory sticks and the memory controller. Now it just powers the memory controller, because the memory sticks have their own power delivery. So this has to do a lot less work than it used to. Um, and it's controlled by a Richtech RT, uh, 8120D, and I'm not entirely certain where, oh, I think it's this thing. Is it? It probably is. The, the thing is, you can get the RT 8120D in a bunch of different, like, package configurations, and my notes don't say which packaging configuration it is, but these, the thing is, these chips I'm pretty sure are for the fan headers. So it's probably this, that's the RT 8120D, and that's the exact same chip that Gigabyte was using. Well, different shape, but same functionality that Gigabyte was using on their DDR4 boards. Um, yeah, and, and this rail really doesn't need to do anything all that special, so this is completely fine for powering the memory controller. Um, and yeah, so that covers basically all of the noteworthy power delivery. Uh, for the memory topology, like I mentioned before, this board uses an 8-layer PCB, and it is a daisy chain topology. Um, it is shielded, right? We can't see any memory traces on the top layer of the board because there's a great big ground fill all just all over it. Um, and on the back of the board, um, we've got kind of the same situation going on, right? This all is just ground. Uh, you can see the command address bus um, for the two memory, well, for both memory channels running through this area. Um, but the command address bus runs at much lower speeds than the actual data queue. Um, so the data queue is buried inside the board under the, the ground fills, um, whereas the command address bus hangs out on the back of the board because it's not that sense, like it's not as sensitive as the data queue is. And this is a pretty standard memory topology for any eight layer uh, AM5 motherboard. Now each vendor is going to have, you know, somewhat different implementations, but this whole top layer ground fill, bottom layer ground fill with command address bus, the, like, the stuff we can see is pretty typical. Like, th this isn't anything that I wouldn't, like, th this isn't surprising. I'd be surprised if we could see the command, like, the, the data queue. Um, I'm not aware of any AM5 motherboards where the data queue is on the top layer or the bottom layer. Um, but, yeah. So from, from what we can see, this is pretty typical. And actually from my uh, experience with like actually overclocking memory on this board, it clocks RAM exactly the same as Gigabyte's X670 boards because they're also 8-layer PCBs using a daisy chain. And the thing is, if you design one good memory topology or even one bad memory topology, why would you design another one, right? Like you're just going to copy paste the memory topology onto every motherboard that has enough layers to accommodate it. And this being a... ATX 8-layer PCB, it uses the same memory topology as Gigabyte's other 8-layer PCB ATX boards and EATX boards, because the EATX boards just, you know, are wider. They, they don't actually affect where the memory slots would go, so, um, yeah. And in terms of memory overclocking capabilities, in my experience, if you have two memory sticks in this um, that are single rank, and your CPU is capable, it'll do 6400. In fact, it'll go over 6400, but it's mostly about your memory controller, much less so about the memory topology in my experience with AM5 so far. So, yeah, um, pretty standard eight layer daisy chain memory topology affair. And nothing, like, I, I've not run into any weirdness. It actually works quite well even in a four dim configuration, though your memory speed limit, you know, comes down a bit. It's not a huge difference. It's not like Intel where 
uh, well, initial Z690, you would go from like 6200 to being stuck at like 5400. With uh, with Ryzen, you go from, you know, like 2x16 will max out at, uh, say, 6400 if your memory, can, if your CPU is really good. Uh, 4x16 will max out at like 6000, 6200, depending on how good your CPU is. Um, I've not tried any more dense configurations than that because I do not have 32 gig DIMMs. Um, though 4x32 is, I'd say, a terrible idea. <laughs> Just... Like, it's a lot of stress on the memory controller, um, and always has been. Even on, on DDR4, running 432 gig DIMMs is not a particularly pleasant experience. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, that's the B650E Aorus Master from Gigabyte. And honestly, like, like I said earlier in the video, this board makes a lot of Gigabyte's X670 lineup look kind of silly. Because... It, like, if you want the crazy gen, you know, quad gen 5 M.2 configuration of the Aorus Extreme, well, guess what? This has that too. Like, it literally has that. I think the only thing that's really missing is, like, you don't get 10 gig LAN, um, which you could buy an add-in card and put your 10 gig LAN down here. Um, I think. I, I've not actually done that myself ever. I have no need for 10 gig LAN, but, you know, if that's something you're interested in, like, yeah, you could just run that off of the chipset. As far as I know, the X670 boards also run the 10 gig LAN through the chipset. It's not connected directly to the CPU. That's that's not a thing. So, yeah, really the only thing that you're sort of lacking on a B650 board is chipset connectivity. Everything else, like memory topology is the same. Power delivery. Like, literally, this is the same VRM as an X670 Aorus Master, but with different inductors. That's the only thing that changed. Um, and the performance is exactly the same. Thermally, voltage regulation-wise, it matches the Aorus Extreme. Um, so, yeah, like, I am not entirely certain, like, this this board to me is basically an X670, like, killer. Because it's way cheaper, does most of the stuff an X670 board does, but, you know, at a lower price. Um, so, yeah. That's it for the video. So thank you for Gigabyte for sending over the board. Um, and that's it. So thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe. Leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, hoodies, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. And I also have a band camp um, where I upload like industrial metal noise stuff you might want to check that out there's links to all of that down in the description uh if you'd like to support the channel um it would be much appreciated so that's it for the video thanks for watching and goodbye <laughs>